Hello, this is London Calling. Good afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you may be. Um, this is the fourth of Euromoney's live stream expert interrogations. Uh, and today we're going to discuss how two multilateral development banks are reacting to the COVID-19 crisis in their region of Latin America. Uh, we're expecting about 300 of you on this call. Uh, welcome to you all. I expect most of you are at home or otherwise in lockdown somewhere. Uh, we hope you're physically well and mentally well and, and doing whatever it is your local health authorities are advising you to do or not do. Um, my name is Christopher Garnett. I'm an external advisor to Euromoney and I'll introduce our speakers in a moment. Um, invisible to you, but essential to the success of this event, is Claudia Franks of Euromoney Conferences, uh, and you might hear us directing questions to her if the tech outstrips our abilities to manipulate it at any point. And, and equally, you have access to her as well, so if you have a tech problem, uh, put it into the Q&A box and Claudia will do her best to, to help you as well. Um, so just whilst you audience members, as I can see from the, the little screen here, are gathering, um, a quick housekeeping note and a formal disclaimer. Uh, the disclaimer says that this stream is for information purposes only. We're not giving investment or transaction advice. All views expressed on this live, live stream are the views of the participants, not of Euromoney. All comments are public and on the record and all content is copyrighted Euromoney Institutional Investor 2020. Uh, you in the audience are all on mute, so we can't hear your dog bark or your telephone go off. Um, and our session is being recorded for later download and viewing. Um, perhaps we'll go viral, uh, but in a good way, obviously. Um, as in all of Euromoney's live streams, we want questions from the audience, you guys out there, uh, and you'll have a box on your screen where you can submit those. There's also a facility to upvote questions you like, not your own. Um, and we'll try to make sure we get to those over the course of our three quarters of an hour or so that we'll be together. And so to our guests today, uh, I hope you can see them. We have live in Tegucigalpa, Dr. Dante Mossi, who is the Executive President of the Central American Bank for Economic Integration, uh, here and after known as CAPE, although you may know it as well as Bessie because for its um, initials in Spanish. Um, and we have Gabriel Ferpeto, who is the Chief Financial Officer of CAF, uh, which used to be the Cooperación Andina de Fomento, uh, but has dramatically outgrown its Andean roots and is now CAF, Development Bank of Latin America. And Gabriel joins us from Bogota. I am in rural Wiltshire in the southwest of England, but by the miracle of modern technology, Euromoney has brought us all together as if we were in the same room. So, um, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, just to get our discussion started, I'd like to ask each of you to give us a quick summary uh, of how the COVID-19 crisis has already affected the work of your institutions uh, and the countries they represent. And if you can tell us what have been your immediate steps to mitigate damage. So um, uh, Dante, why don't we start with, with Cabe? Thank you, thank you, Chris. Um, let me start by saying that the crisis here in, in Central America, I, I would say, uh, began on um, March uh, 12th, uh, when the, the presidents of Central America invited me for a meeting. And uh, to be honest with you, I, I mean, I just learned that some of the countries had begun to close borders. But then when I had a conversation with all the presidents, I started to realize how, how bad it was. I mean, uh, in terms of... Uh, countries like Costa Rica and the Dominican Republic and Panama started to have can massive cancellations of uh, hotels and events and conferences and uh, uh, other countries uh, were basically shutting down borders. And uh, so they knew uh, they were going for something not seen for a while. So uh, the immediate uh, you know, uh, reaction from countries was how do I respond to the uh, sanitary crisis, and in essence, all of Central America, except Nicaragua, uh, began in a limited way or a full-blown uh, shutdown of borders. 
And uh, in the case of the Northern Triangle, they uh, established a, a quarantine. So people could not get out of their houses for a week, at least for a week. And um, so, you know, the first effects were felt like that week in which uh, all uh, flights were halted. And, uh, uh, you know, something you give like, like you know, a given, <laughs> it didn't happen. So uh, countries were getting ready for the emergency. Basic, you know, necessities like Lysol sprays disappear in, in a matter of uh, half a day. Uh, but then when you started to, uh, you know, wanted to do a bit more on, 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 the, uh, on these uh, testing kits, they were gone as well. So, I mean, everything changed. And uh, so uh, the, mo the closest thing I, I, can, I can think of this uh, uh, emergency is, uh, you know, having a hurricane in, in, the, in the region, but this hurricane, uh, you know, would last three months. So, um, and then, you know, after the hurricane passes, then you start reconstruction. So the region has taken a, a really bad hit. I mean, they're really um, increasing uh, uh, public expenditures to uh, distribute basic food and, uh, and medical supplies that were not in the budget. And um, so they're really scrambling uh, to find these new sources of, of uh, financing. Um, very oddly enough, the countries with more fiscal space are the ones that actually are more able to actually to react quicker. The ones that are a bit tighter on their budgets are the ones that uh, have more, uh, you know, a difficulty in, in, in getting ready for the emergency. So anyway, um, just to summarize, uh, there's a, a big stoppage of, uh, of all economic activity and uh, people is losing jobs. Uh, some people cannot find food. And uh, so, uh, you know, all governments are really scrambling to find ways, quick ways, to actually to deliver all these basic necessities to, to, to affected people. So uh, I, I will say the, the, the highest concern is getting out of the emergency and then focus on the, on the reconstruction. We'll, we'll come back to you in a second, Dante, to ask what specific steps CAFE has taken. But um, Gabriel, I mean, a lot of what Dante has just said obviously applies throughout the whole region, not just Central America, the sub-region. Um, but what what have you seen in, in your countries that's particularly of note? Sure. Uh, th thank you, Chris. And uh, well, um, thank you to everybody for joining to, to the call. I hope everybody is safe uh, at their homes. Uh, well, we had, uh, as you said, uh, Chris, a very similar experience throughout Latin America. I mean, it's almost the same. I remember we were in, in Buenos Aires at the beginning of March. It was uh, March 5th or so. And that same day, the, the first um, uh, people dying in, in Buenos Aires was that same day. And during the meeting, the, it was not included in the agenda, but during the meeting, the, the, the shareholders agreed to approve uh, an extraordinary uh, package for, for what we knew at that time. Uh, the, the crisis was not big at the time. It, it developed very quickly after that, but at the time it was not that, that bad. And, and the ministers decided to approve a program of uh, first loans, uh, emergency loans of up to $300 million for all of the countries. Uh, this was for attending immediate uh, problems in, in, in the sanitary uh, areas. And also some grants, uh, around $6, $6 million for all of the countries. Uh, as you may imagine, these uh, funds were drawn very quickly after that. So very quick reaction. Right after that, I mean, uh, situation um, uh, worsened uh, dramatically. Uh, and uh, it, it, was not, it is not only the, the sanitary emergency, which is certainly a big issue, but, but even uh, more than that, we, uh, we saw first that the world is, is uh, dropping. I mean, uh, it's entering into recession. You see every day, I have some, some polls for, uh, taken from Bloomberg and you see every day, I mean, the, for example, the GDP growth is, is every uh, day dropping. I mean, the forecast for, for the year for, for the countries in Latin America is the same. Uh, the latest numbers I saw from the IDB, for example, is 5% uh, decrease in GDP for, for the year, which is, of course, very dramatic. I mean, this is on average, and, and some countries are, are declining uh, much more than that. 
uh, you see drops in, in raw materials, which uh, sadly our, our countries are, uh, most of them are dependent on, on commodities. Uh, well, the, the, the case of the oil, of course, is the more dramatic. They, they even get into negative uh, numbers uh, this week. Uh, you have volatility in prices, the increase in, 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 in the country risks. Uh, you, you see the, the MV uh, in this uh, and, and it's grown dramatically, for, of course, depending on, on, the, on the country. It varies, uh, but but even the, the highest uh, rated countries are increasing their, their financing costs. So in general, well, what uh, we decided, uh, of course, in, in accordance with, with our shareholders, is to approve a bigger line, which uh, has a total of $2.5 billion, uh, not just for, for the sanitary emergency right now, but mostly driven to act uh, uh, counter-cyclical in order to help the countries to recover their, their economies, uh, at least putting uh, our, our part. Of course, we, we, we know this is not enough. I mean, we have to, to work together with other agencies. We, we may enter into that later, uh, but that was what we, we've done so far. Uh, also, we are uh, working not only with sovereigns, but also with private sector, particularly well, with development. Yes. You, you, you are unusual in amongst development banks in having private sector shareholders as part of your structure. Exactly, yes. Yes. Um, I was just going to say to the audience out there, now 146 of you, um, do please put some questions in that box. Uh, not that we are short of questions here. Um, one point which I'd, I'd like both of you to comment on is that something which you don't necessarily immediately think of as, as affecting um, economies in Latin America, which, well, which obviously profoundly does, is that remittances from citizens in working in the US, for example, or in other countries, um, presumably almost immediately stop. Uh, and that's a fairly dramatic, uh, has a fairly dramatic impact potentially on families in the region. Have you looked specifically at that, Dante? Yes, actually, I was uh, having a conversation with a couple of banks and remittances fell, the level of remittances fell, I mean, they keep on growing, uh, uh, but um, the rate of growth uh, actually fell, but uh, it's still there. So that, that's a quite a relief in the US, as you know, the quarantine is not as strict, so people still sending money. Uh, but, but uh, you know, in terms of uh, flows of money, I mean, something we have seen is how private sector is being, um, you know, being squeezed. I mean, there, there's a liquidity crisis. I mean, the, this, this credit uh, line from commercial banks outside Central America are starting to to uh, to limit the, the the funding available to uh, to these banks. So, uh, but coming to your question, I mean, uh, the main source of liquidity, which is uh, uh, remittances, is, is very much alive. So uh, that hasn't taken a hit. I'm more concerned when those remittances. Uh, go into what people call the, the, the slowdown in the U.S. because that, that's when, when you have this uh, um, the slowdown also in remittances. So uh, thankfully, uh, on average, they, they, they fell a bit, but they're, they're still a main component of, of the external financing of the region. Good. Well, that's, that's a positive thing to hear, at least. Um, it is. I don't know if you have a particular comment on that. Uh, we can move on to the next topic if you like. Um, share, you both talked already about shareholder meetings and how you've met with the governments uh, that form your, your shareholding countries. Um, you have seven overlapping shareholder countries, I, I discovered when I, uh, I, I totted them all up. Um, in Central America, you have just Panama and Costa Rica, but you also have the DR, Gabriel, which uh, of course is also a member of CABE. Um, are you are shareholder countries, governments in the region, are they all pulling together under your umbrellas or is there a little bit of, uh, as it's fair to say, it's been widely commented on in Europe, countries looking after their own interests? How are shareholders coming together? Gabriel, let's start with you. Well, uh, what I can tell from ProCap is that they, they are very loyal to the institution. I mean, they, they come together to, to us, for sure. They, they talk to, to themselves. Uh, uh, you know, in, in our case, uh, I think it's similar to, to Cabe, but uh, I'm only talking about, about cash. Uh, 
uh, most of our shareholders are the same borrowers. It's, it's different from, from other uh, institutions that they have more uh, shareholders from other regions. Uh, of course, it's changing a little bit, but in, in both cases, uh, at least, but, but, but currently most of the shareholders are the same borrowers. So uh, my, my take is that uh, because of that factor, they are not only uh, looking for financing, which is of course true, particularly in this uh, very bad situation, but they're also uh, taking care of the institution as well. They, they have both, both hats. And this worked very well, I mean, uh, in this situation. They, they are worried, of course, of asking for, for loans. Uh, actually, if we see the demand after we announced the, the, this $2.5 billion line, uh, this almost uh, allocated. Uh, actually, we have more demand than, 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 than that. And we are trying also to accommodate that, of course. Uh, but they're also uh, looking and asking how uh, they can uh, support uh, CAPS uh, financially. And, and in that sense, uh, during this uh, latest board of directors, for example, the, the, the discussions were also, uh, for example, increasing the number of seats in the board for uh, countries outside the region because they know they, this increases the, the, the financial uh, strength of the institution. Uh, they also approve uh, what is called the uh, uh, emergency liquidity facility for countries with uh, very high difficulties. Of course, this, this was uh, specifically addressed to the case of Venezuela, and they supported the idea. Uh, uh, and it was approved unanimously, uh, uh, meaning that uh, the, the support in, in order to maintain the caps, the financial very solid, are there. I mean, they, they are looking for both sides of the equation. Uh, uh, of course, they are, for example, covering all of their capital contributions with, uh, you may understand this, this, in this situation, it's, it's not easy, I mean, but, but they've been very loyal and all of them are current in their payments. So, of course, uh, as always, they've been uh, current in, in their payments on, on their loans uh, as ever. So, so it, it's working very well indeed. Good. D Dente, you, a couple of points before you answer the same question. You yesterday, of course, concluded a, a capital increase, which had a nominal capital increase, which had been uh, flagged, but obviously had been in the pipeline for some considerable time, but nonetheless, it was a notable thing to conclude at this particular moment. Um, so tell us, tell us a bit about that. But also, of course, a com um, distinct from, from CAF, uh, you, of course, do have two uh, significant shareholders in Asia, uh, which are countries that obviously you're not lending into. Um, so I'd be interested to know particularly how the uh, Republic of China, Taiwan, and the Republic of Korea, South Korea, have been helping you during this period. Right. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, we had uh, the ongoing uh, capitalization process of, of the bank. And I think the reaction of, uh, uh, at the emergency was to accelerate the process uh, from the uh, countries, the member uh, founding uh, countries. But then, uh, you know, we had a pleasant surprise from our Asian shareholders. Um, they actually indicated they wanted to uh, go ahead with the 40% increase or more. And uh, instead of uh, putting the capital in, in installments, they rather would do it in one go to uh, strengthen the finances of the bank. So uh, we had a very, um, you know, pleasant surprise from ministers of finance from uh, both from uh, South Korea and Taiwan at 3 a.m. in the morning local time in Honduras so uh, I was not sleeping well those days but uh, but basically you know uh, the finances of the, of the bank have become really strengthened by by this uh, commitment uh, we hope that next week we will send out the formal invitations to all shareholders to, to come and, uh, and, and and come to the table with the new capital but also uh, we had an, an extraordinary, you know, uh, sort of uh, reaction from our partners in, in both in Europe and Asia. And they were very willing to uh, restructure, uh, you know, like uh, programs we had for small and medium enterprise into these uh, short term programs. So the reaction of uh, shareholders and friends of CAVE uh, has been really uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, a lot of flexibility, um, you know, I. I didn't mention the, the actual program we have, which is about $2 billion. Um, the reality is that we are uh, 
you know, using a, a lot of um, funds from our partners to leverage this package. Um, for example, there's a private sector fund to inject liquidity in the short term to preserve jobs. Uh, we put $350 million, and so far we, we are at, at about $800 million because other partners have actually come and, and leverage our, our, our money. So um, we had a very positive response from shareholders. Um, you know, even our own, in, in the middle of the crisis, they went ahead with the capitalization. Mm -hmm. And uh, countries that were extra regional are also coming uh, to help out, both in new capital and uh, modifying credit lines. Well, what I was, I was interested to ask you as well, just quickly, is um, Korea, South Korea and Taiwan are both, you know, they're the two, two of the real poster children for dealing with this crisis in, in a public health sense have they shared some of their expertise some of their best practice with you is, is that part of the conversation yes and uh, actually one of the quickest reactions we got from south korea was the access to the uh coronavirus test kits i mean uh, it's amazing how uh the availability of medical equipment uh was really strained and uh so basically with uh south korea we actually got access to all the biomedical uh, equipment and uh, testing kits. And uh, so it's coming uh, to, to the region uh, very unexpectedly, uh, I would say. Uh, it's a new newcomer to, to the region. And uh, so the impact has been very much felt to the region. And in the case of Taiwan also, uh, you know, with all these um, masks and uh, gloves and medical uh, equipment, it's also coming from Asia. So. Yes, uh, the region is looking to Asia to learn on how to contain this emergency um, from the sanitary point of view, uh, more than from Europe. So, uh, so the influence of Asia at the bank has been very much appreciated by everyone. Excellent. Um, Gabriel, I've got a couple of questions coming in or several questions coming in related specifically to markets and to capital markets. Um, Keith Mullen is asking that, um, um, current conditions in the international bond markets in terms of spreads and so on. Uh, he mentions there haven't been too many Latin American borrowers, or, although I noticed that one of your uh, founder countries, Peru, um, had a dramatically over $3 billion bond issue a couple of days ago. Um, but if you could just tell us a little bit from your point of view what you think market conditions are for borrowers such as yourself at the moment. Sure. Uh, maybe I can comment. Uh first uh, about the general market conditions in general. Uh, what we've seen is that uh, after uh, a period of uh, market close down, uh, for sure, for, for actually for all of the issues, after that, the market reopened uh, very strongly. In fact, I mean, you see uh, several uh, countries, well, you mentioned Peru. Uh, I just saw that Mexico just announced a transaction today. And I think Guatemala yesterday. So you, you see that countries, maybe the, with the higher uh, ratings are uh, have market access. Uh, however, paying a premium, for, of course. And this premium is paid not only by, by EM uh, issuers, but also by, uh, for example, a highly rated supernaturals. I'm, I'm talking about the AAA ones. I mean, they, this one, they, they are not used to, to pay uh, new issue premiums, but they, they have, of course, because of, of, of the current situation. Having the market is, is open, is there. I mean, in, in our case, uh, we, we did uh, some pre-funding at the end of last year. We ended up with, with uh, a very high liquidity position. So we are very comfortable. Actually, we, we, we haven't gone to, to the market so far this year. Uh, however, we, we should, uh, we are looking into the market. So, uh, I don't know the exactly timing for that. I mean, we were very comfortable at this, as I said before. Uh, um, we are, are looking for sure, uh, as has been the case for, for many years, issuing uh, benchmark size transactions, both in dollars and euros, that those are our main markets. Uh, for example, last year we, we did uh, two benchmarks, one at 1.25 billion in dollars, and our first benchmark uh, transaction, which was a green bond uh, in, in euros as well, 750 million. And we would like to repeat that this year. Uh, I don't know the timing for that, but Cetera, we're looking at another market. Uh, I have here uh, the list of, of the markets we would we, we like to, to, to tap as well, so, such as the Swiss franc, for example, kangaroo market, 
uh, again. And the, another one, we've, we've been out of that for, for many years because just because of pricing, because of the swap market, which is the samurai market. Uh, uh, so in yeah, yes. Sorry to interrupt, but I noticed that uh, the IDB did an Indonesian rupiah in, uh, issue, which was the first in an emerging market currency during this period. Exactly. Uh, can can, can uh, I, I just wish to? to you know, when we, we obviously time is never on our side on these things. Um, Dante, do you have a, a comment about about markets and? Uh, I mean, between you two and the Republic of Chile are the sort of top three triumvirate at the top of the Latin American ratings uh, tree. Um, are you expecting your ratings to be impacted in any way by this crisis? Dante first. I, all right. No, if anything, I think they should go up as uh, my main triple A shareholders are increasing their participation in the bank. So that, that should be a very uh, strong signal of financial strength. Uh, and the strength of the global capital of these uh, two giants from Asia. Uh, also, I mean, the, um, you know, the countries from the region are actually going off to the market in like Guatemala and Panama, and they have done fantastic. So in terms of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, going to the market and getting good prices. So um, you know, I'm not expecting downgrades, although I'm, I must confess that some countries might suffer some. Um, but uh, overall, I, I don't think that should have a, a big impact on the, on ratings or, I mean, even, you know, uh, there was this conversation with the G20 about their forgiveness that created a bit of noise in, in, in the region. Uh, and actually, I went to every minister of finance and I said, I, you know, we, we don't allow those, <laughs> uh, that kind of um, their forgiveness uh, very early on just to prevent. And, uh, what CAVE did is that we actually created our own trust fund or CAVE fund uh, to actually to uh, manage grants and uh, to look for uh, partners that can help with the emergency on grant basis, but no of their forgiveness at all. So, I mean, the capital markets are pretty much alive and uh, all the countries are very much aware that that's off the table. Um, so I, I don't think rating should suffer at all. Okay, let's let's turn to let's turn let's turn to a slightly different topic, another topic from the um, from the audience out there, um, which is something we want to talk about anyway. How do you how do your two institutions integrate or, or align or, or collaborate in your activities with other regional banks? Um, the IDB being the obvious example, but but also of course with global institutions, uh, Washington Washington institutions. Um, Gabrielle, how how much collaboration is going on between MDBs? Yes, uh, Chris, this is a very good question. Uh, I mean, uh, normally we try to collaborate, of course, uh, during normal times. I think these times of crisis uh, uh, forces us to collaborate more. Let's put it that way. Uh, if you include all of the funds available from other from MDBs, certainly are not sufficient. So, so we should coordinate. I mean, we, we are in conversations with uh, all of the supranationals that work in the region, including, of course, uh, CAVE. We, we had some conversations as well. Uh, but also with um, institutions, uh, uh, local institutions from developed countries. For example, from, from Japanese, uh, the bank for JABIC, the Japanese Bank for International Cooperation, or KW, or AD from France, and so forth. Uh, and everybody is, is in these days is, are doing the same. Uh, but to, to be honest, uh, when we add up the numbers, uh, there is still uh, more needed. I mean, uh, we believe, particularly in the Latin America, we believe there, there's more need for uh, financing from developed countries in, in general. Uh, we should work uh, together with, with the regional uh, development banks in order to attract more uh, money from these, from these countries as well. Um, Dante, have you been talking more to um, Mr. Moreno in Washington than you have done normally? Yes, I mean, actually, uh, we have been chatting a lot with the IDB and, and, and the World Bank and CAF uh, for the first time, I would say, uh, in a significant way, because most of the countries are demanding budget, budget support, emergency budget support. So what CAVE uh, is doing, uh, when we cannot you know, co-finance an operation, we actually 
uh, tell the countries, give me the matrix of conditions that you have uh, done with CAF or with uh, the IDB or the World Bank. So we come to the table with the same matrix of, uh, of conditions. So like in the Dominican Republic, they are planning uh, for a big uh, uh, you know, coordinated program. So even though we will not co-finance uh, directly, but uh, the principle is that we will all come to the table with the same uh, set of conditions uh, in which we fully agree that, that that's the way to go. So, uh, but on the private sector as well, we are uh, having very intense conversations with IFC, with IDB Invest to um, join forces, uh, particularly in Central America, which is, you know, countries are about the same size and many. So there's, a, a, you know, some sort of economy of scale if they actually work through us rather than, you know, going to individual countries. So, uh, so we're having this, uh, you know, very, um, I mean, I'm, I'm having a conversation tomorrow with the World Bank and the IDB uh, uh, again, uh, just to kind of let, let everyone know what uh, each one is doing. I mean, we have to realize that different institutions have different, you know, time frames to process things and uh, loans and, uh, but at least we are talking and uh, in as much as possible in countries like Honduras and and Costa Rica and now the Dominican Republic, we are uh, really working together in as much as possible uh, just to minimize the transaction cost of the countries. Okay. And um, question from the audience specifically about panda bonds, which obviously for Taiwanese reasons don't apply to CABE. Uh, but Gabriel, have you received support from the, the question says, what support have you received from China in terms of panda bonds or similar? Well, Panda Bonds is, is, um, is a project that has been uh, on, on the works for some time now uh, for different reasons. First was uh, mainly regulatory reasons uh, because uh, the government there asked for, for many formalities and, and, and actually some of them were very, uh, were not cost efficient. So we were not uh, inclined to do that. Uh, and, and also because uh, the swap is very volatile, so so it's, it's not always uh, available. So that that, but that may change in in the near future. It's not something that is a priority for us. So right now, but certainly something that we, we, we may take a look at. That. Okay, and I'll stick with stick with you, Gabriel, for another question just coming from, from out there. And um, do you have, or do you plan to have, or do you plan to ease the criteria for accessing your funding um, in terms of private sector borrowers? As it's meant, Gabriel. Well, private sector, uh, at this time, we are uh, focusing all of our efforts working with local development banks. I mean, uh, we, we believe that in this uh, crisis, uh, dealing with individual clients is, is less efficient. I mean, I mean, local development banks know better their clients. So we are supporting them in order for them to own land to, to these private sector clients. That, that's our main, main, main focus. And is, uh, that, is, that, and, is that happening? Yes. Is, that, is that flow already visible? Yes, indeed, indeed. We're, we're working with, well, we're, we're, the, these uh, local development banks uh, are clients from CAF for many years now, but, but now uh, we are increasing, increasing the lines to this type of, 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 uh, of clients. Uh, Dante, is that the same for CABE? Yes, I mean, we are actually, um, you know, working not with China, but uh, with uh, Taiwan and Korea. Um, most of our uh, green bond last year was actually absorbed by Taiwan. So, uh, but, uh, you know, coming to the question on how do we work, uh, we also work through the big regional banks uh, to reach the private sector. And, uh, you know, we have talked to the European Union, to, uh, to Spain, uh, Germany, uh, that there's a, an, an economy of scale if they work through us. And so far that has been, uh, you know, the way to go. And uh, so we are lever leveraging our program, um, I would say in a proportion one-to-one -one with them. So we have excellent support, particularly from uh, case WAFD, uh, COFIDES, uh, uh, ICDF from, uh, from Taiwan and Korea Exim Bank. So, uh, yes, our, our our two billion dollar program is probably going to be more than than three billion dollars uh, once it's uh, you know it's, it's all accounted for. Okay, um, 
a couple of um, three letter words, well, one of them isn't quite a word, uh, have been in the press a bit re recently. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but they're both very relevant. One is oil, um, for which, you, of course, you now get paid for filling up your tank, which is, as I have a noisy V8, it's very good for me. Um, and the other is UBI, or Universal Basic Income, which is an idea that's been current for a while, but is definitely getting a lot more airtime. Um, Gabrielle, obviously among your membership, you have, you have some significant oil producers. Uh, in Cabe's case, uh, the core members at least are all uh, net importers. Um, give us your thoughts on, on what the oil situation means and a word on UBI, Gabrielle, if you could, and then same to Dante. Well, in our case, of course, the, the, the most obvious uh, countries that are dependent on oil are, of course, Venezuela is one, uh, but well, the, the situation is quite particular these days. Uh, the, the other uh, one is, is Ecuador, of course. They are also uh, being uh, very affected because of this situation. Uh, I would say uh, to a lesser degree in Colombia as well. So those, those will be the countries more, 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 more affected, but, but very different uh, uh, type of, of countries in, in general. Uh, so that, that's for what, what I can say. Uh, Ecuador, of course, is, uh, as you know, now in the process of trying to restructure the debt, but they are doing uh, things well, but, but very difficult situation. In the case of, of Venezuela, it's another story because it's not only a, a, a matter of the price of oil, but also a, a matter of the production size, which is also dropped dramatically. So, so it's difficult to predict what is going to happen in the country. And do you have a thought on universal basic income? Is that a topic? Is that an idea whose time has come? Uh, not really. And, uh, I haven't heard a lot about that, that situation. I don't know, Dante. But a lot of countries are, are effectively doing it already, aren't they? Um, both in the region and, and elsewhere. Well, at least on a, on a one-off basis. Um, Dante, yeah. oil, oil and Central America uh, have a rather different relationship, obviously, from the relationship with Colombia or, or Ecuador or Venezuela. Um, how are you seeing this bizarre situation in the oil price playing out for your economies? On, on the face of it, it's beneficial. Is, uh, pretty much. I mean, uh, chatting with the central banks, uh, they have seen reserves of foreign currency, uh, you know, uh, to be growing, be not because they are accumulating, you know, more money because uh, they are really good about it, but it's just because the price effect is really having a positive effect on, uh, uh, on the oil bill that these countries have. So, um, so that, that's a very positive shock to the economy. And about the basic income, um, you know, most of the, some of the countries like El Salvador has adopted uh, some social protection sort of scheme um, because uh, there's a lot of people that lost jobs and, uh, and they don't have money to actually buy basic food. In the case of Honduras and Guatemala, for example, they have taken the approach of delivering uh, bags of basic staples uh, to the urban poor um, as a way to maintain income. But the reality is, uh, I mean, I had a conversation with the private sector of uh, Honduras and, and, uh, and El Salvador, and they're really afraid that after all this crisis is set and done, uh, there's gonna be a lot of people without a job. So, uh, and you know, there's no unemployment insurance or anything like it. So people will have to do something about it. So uh, there's a serious concern that after the crisis is over, the social protection networks will have to be beefed up. Um, no country has asked us for that yet, but I see, with the exception of El Salvador, uh, uh, a request for uh, funding this type of program, and they get a $300 uh, um, check uh, for, for during the crisis and they will see whether they will renew this program later on. So I, I think uh, different countries will adopt some sort of social protection program that is going to maintain, you know, at least the basic needs of, uh, of people. That's, that's interesting. So uh, UBI is an idea whose time, whose time comes. Um, what role, to question another question from the audience here, 
what role will you have in the wave of sovereign debt restructurings that will come in the next 18 months? Um, Ecuador and Argentina are mentioned, they're obviously already in um, restructuring talks, but um, do you envisage, Gabriel, any of your other member countries going into restructuring talks and will you be involved? Will you help them? Uh, well, so, so far, I, I don't envision any other country apart from, from Argentina and Ecuador going into this, this process. Uh, actually, I was, uh, um, certainly, we, would, we will not participate and, and won't help on, on these restrictions at all, of course. Uh, I, actually, the, this uh, takes me back to the questions on the ratings uh, that Dante was answering before. I totally agree with him that this type of situations not only uh, don't um, uh, work against our ratings, but also, but, but uh, on the contrary, they work in favor of the ratings of supranationals in general. I mean, we, we've seen this, uh, unfortunately, many crises before uh, in the past. Uh, and if you see after this crisis, because the preferred credit treatment uh, is ratified and is tested in, in real uh, life uh, tests, which is uh, this, this crisis. Uh, mm, several ratings from supranationals, certainly is, it was the case for CAF in the past, were raised. Uh, and, and so uh, that because uh, countries not only uh, mm, don't restructure or, or uh, do any, any type of, of financial engineering with, with, with supernatural debt, but they pay their debts on, on time, even during these very difficult situations. And we expect this to remain the same in this, in this crisis. And this happening, of course, as I said before. Um, just sticking with you, Gabriel, for a moment, for perhaps obvious reasons, um, there is a question on the board about Venezuela. Um, I mean, Venezuela clearly was in a pretty good mess before all this started. Clearly, this is, you know, the, one of the newspapers said yesterday, this will push uh, Venezuela over the edge and, and, you know, maybe we'll see a change of government there. Um, but so talk to that point if you would, but, but also there's an, a second aspect to the Venezuela question, which is, of course, the millions of Venezuelan migrants, refugees, call them what you will, who are currently in neighboring countries, and not only neighboring countries. I mean, as far as Peru, there's a million in Peru, there's, I don't know, two and a half million in Colombia. Um, they, those are clearly um, not very welcome visitors whilst countries are trying to manage their own crises. Tell us a bit about your view on that. Well, in general, our relationship with uh, Venezuela and uh, with Venezuela, the country, is, is a good one. I mean, of course, you, 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 we're not in, involved in politics at all, of course. Uh, Venezuela is one of the largest shareholders and also one of the largest borrowers in CAF. Uh, you already mentioned that they're in massive default with almost everyone, uh, but CAF. I mean, they, uh, during all of these crises, they've been current with CAF, which uh, certainly uh, highlights the very good relationship and, and certainly, uh, it, I would say, is the toughest uh, proof that the preferred credit treatment uh, works in our case. Uh, and, and this has been recognized, of course, by, by the agencies. Uh, we, we understand the difficult situation. That's why I mentioned before that the Shareholders Assembly approved this uh, liquidity uh, program for the country. Uh, which is working well and, and also contributes that uh, one, that the country uh, has some uh, more uh, space in, in order to uh, use the liquidity not to uh, repay the debts to, to us. But uh, on the other hand, it keeps uh, our loan portfolio clean. So it works in, in both ways. So it, it's a very strong, a very um, signal of uh, support from all of the shareholders including Venezuela as well. Uh, what you mentioned about the, the migrants, well, of course, this is a very difficult situation. We, we see the, uh, I live in Bogota and, and certainly I, I live the situation uh, uh, firsthand, of course, every day. Uh, we uh, work with, with the governments and we're trying to support them, providing some technical cooperation and also some, some funds in order to, to support the countries uh, to, um, uh, withstand the, this situation, but certainly it's a difficult one. Uh, we, we're, we're trying to, to help as much as, as we can. 
Uh, questions coming specifically for, for you, Dante. I, I think it's somebody who is, uh, who is already a fan, uh, but it's somebody asking specifically about why do you think that the um, CICA, the, you know, the Central American Integration System, which is obviously a, a sort of a governmental transstatal thing of which you're in some sense is the financial arm. Um, somebody is saying, um, the, it's a very long question, but um, impact of political will of the governments on the process. Are there any particular reasons why this outstanding level of collaboration has come about in Central America ahead of other regions? So I don't know if you want to claim you're ahead of other regions, but um, there's, there's a question there from somebody specifically addressed to you. Yeah, no, look, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased by the uh, reaction how uh, presidents, I mean, at the very high level, presidents, Minister of Finance, Minister of Health, are actually exchanging information, uh, which is fantastic because, uh, you know, some countries, I mean, as, as an example, when El Salvador began to shut down the borders, uh, which everyone thought President Bukele is, uh, is not right from what he said, but then everyone started to do it the same thing because they realized it makes sense. So uh, there's a lot of information exchange. Uh, you know, we have done these uh, integrated purchases of, uh, of medicines uh, and we have helped in the financing of, of these uh, processes. I mean, the economies as, uh, on their own are actually too small. So there's an economy of scale when they actually uh, come together. So I think uh, that works in the advantage of, of the region. One other thing that, uh, Chris, I think is important to, uh, to highlight is that the same presidents, even though they shut down the border for people, they actually allow borders to have commerce. So, you know, the second best client of Central America is Central America. So that actually has come to be, uh, you know, a life savior in terms of trade. Uh, because, uh, you know, particularly foodstuffs are actually still moving uh, around Central America. And this is a result of uh, these integration schemes in which countries do share information and decide, you know, uh, on a coordinated way what to stop, what, what not to. So, um, so I think working with SICA has been, uh, uh, you know, put to the test and uh, I think it's, it's going well. Uh, things could be go better in the future, but so far the coordination has proven to be very useful, at least to me. Okay, good. Um, I do want to look, we only got a few minutes left, um, I want to look a little bit beyond, if we can, um, and one thing that interests me that I think will become a, become a worldwide question, um, will dealing with the current crisis um, diminish emphasis and focus on environmental imperatives. Um, Gabrielle, both our institutions obviously are very alive to environmental issues and, and so on, but Gabrielle, is that something that um, you think might become a concern? I mean, looking, you know, years down the road, we'll be more worried about viruses than about CO2. Well, yes, yeah, it's difficult to, to, to predict what is going to happen. In, in my view, certainly in the short run, particularly this year, uh, some funds that were uh, addressed specifically for projects in, uh, into the environmental sector will be redirected to, to, to deal with this uh, sanitary crisis, of course. It is happening, I mean, uh, and for, for many re for obvious reasons, but, but also because some of the projects are delayed or because countries are, are dealing now with this situation. Uh, in our case, we are very committed to uh, financing the, the, the project related to the environment. I mean, we have committed, we, we are part of, of the IDFC, IDFC club, uh, which is confirmed by other supras and some uh, development banks throughout the world. And we've committed to increase the approvals in, in, the, in the green sector uh, up to 40% in 10 years now. So when we are about 20%. So said that our commitment is there. Uh, we expect to, to maintain the commitment even this year, uh, although we recognize it's difficult because of what I explained before, but, but, but I, don't think, I don't think that down the road will be, uh, will we deviate from, from that, uh, from that uh, sector. And I mean, it's too important. I mean, uh, this, this pandemic will, will go away. We hope that at some point in time, we hope sooner rather than later, but 
but the, the, the climate change will, will continue to be there for some time, unfortunately. Dante, is this, is this something that, that worries you? You're going to have to work quite hard, I think, to get people focused on your, uh, on your green priorities uh, when the house is on fire. Yeah. Well, look, I, I think uh, actually, if anything, they're going to be um, highlighted. You know, one part of the crisis is because of lack of proper uh, water and sanitation system. You need to wash your hands, but if you don't have water, I mean, that, that would be an issue. So, um, you know, basically, uh, the big plans from water and sanitation, uh, the train in Costa Rica, um, they are probably, you know, a bit delayed, a couple of months. But the agenda has not stopped. And also, we are also working in the blue economy in the Pacific coast, how to generate sustainable jobs from the sea. That also keeps on going. So uh, no, we are not uh, throwing away those plans. Uh, we are delaying those plans uh, for a couple of months. But we will continue with the green agenda. And um, even, uh, even though the prices of oil have come down, I mean, we have not seen cancellations of plans for um, you know, renewable energy uh, projects in the region. So, so the agenda seems to be a bit delayed, but not cancelled at all. Okay, good. Um, well, we're we're sort of coming to um, coming to the uh, the close of our allotted time. Um, I'll take another. I'm not sure if the upvoting is um, is working. I it's not actually working for me, so I can't see which questions people are upvoting. Um, let me just have a quick look um, at what we've got here. I will upvote one myself. Um, well, here's a nice, here's a nice sunny Generation X kind of question. Um, returning to a new normality, what are your, that's, that's an assumption in that question. What are your views on digital transformation of your banks and integrating the young population of the region into productive activities? Um, Gabrielle, have you got any young people around? Uh, yes, of course, many, many <laughs> young people. I mean, <laughs> uh, digital transformation is something that, I mean, we're, we're, they've been there for, for some time. We're, we're working very heavily uh, on that front. But, but certainly you need to, to adapt to, to new generations. I mean, they, they are there, they're working uh, they were different. I think this uh, this uh, situation that we are facing right now will also accelerate the, this this fact. I mean, we were all working uh, remotely, and, and it's working well. I mean, uh, some some uh, things that that new uh, generation are asking, for example, is flexibility on on, on their schedules for for work, and, and they are having this now. So I, I don't think we are going back to the same. Uh, normality we had before the, this pandemic. Okay, before Dante asks the same question, I'll just make a point um, that seems to me quite relevant though, perhaps particularly in, in this region, um, is that distance working and all of that kind of thing is all very well for people who have jobs and are salaried employees. Um, it's not so great if you live hand to mouth by polishing shoes or, or changing money in the street or, or selling fruit in, the, in, the, in an open market. And of course, many of the populations in our region live exactly like that, literally hand to mouth. Um, so potentially, the digitalization is is a negative because it creates even greater inequality. Sorry, I, d I don't want to rain on your parade, but I think it's worth bearing that aspect in mind. Um, Dante, what's your view on, on this? Well, look, uh, just uh, to add to the telework, uh, you know, transformation, we have at the bank, we have uh, this uh, business continuity uh, plan. And uh, so we have the plan, but, uh, you know, usually we have a crisis in one country, but not all of them at the same time. So this was quite a challenge and we are processing record amounts of loans uh, without being physically at the main building. We were forced to actually move into electronic uh, signatures. Uh, so I don't think we're going back to that. Uh, but also on the market, I will tell you that because you don't have access to, to the bank in the traditional way, um, the pressure on the electronic means of payments are actually being put to the test. Uh, delivery services, uh, um, you know, these things were there like, um, 
you know, something extravagant for the UPs of the region. But uh, now it's pretty much uh, a basic need to be able to order something from a distance. Uh, I mean, people cannot move, so, uh, so the services need to move for you. Uh, so in that sense, I think, uh, you know, the young population is actually uh, setting a new trend. And, uh, you know, we need this because of, uh, you know, the market can, can misbehave and uh, like, like now. So having those electronic means of payments is essential. And I'm talking more than credit or debit cards. I'm talking about payments by mobile phones and, uh, and other means of payment that uh, are not happening. How do you transfer money from a parent uh, to your son or daughter that cannot uh, come home? So the, that has, has stressed the system. So I think solutions are being developed. Uh, there's a lot of innovation and uh, I'm sure, you know, this digital transformation will, will you know, if anything, it got a boost. Uh, so uh, we certainly hope to keep working with this very young population of Central America well, that will demand those services. As we always like to say, no hay mal que por bien no viene. So every cloud has a silver lining. Um, if okay. digitally driven financial inclusion became a result of COVID-19, uh, for the populations in our countries, then we could take some comfort from that. Um, gentlemen, I think we probably need to wrap up. I'm not getting a big red sign on my screen, but we run for fit over 50 minutes now. Um, just before we go, uh, I do have a, a note on the Beat the Expert competition that was being run on these streams a couple of weeks ago, where we asked people to predict China's Q1 GDP uh, number. Uh, the figure announced by the Chinese government was not, was minus 9.8%. Uh, and the winner of the competition, and I'm assured this isn't fixed, uh, was our friend Marcus Langston, who works for Euromoney in Hong Kong, uh, who forecast 88 So apparently he's going to get a bottle of delicious hot sauce uh, from my friend Richard Banks. Now, Richard Banks is going to be back next week doing the next Euromoney live stream. I'm delighted to announce our, uh, our guest, another old friend, uh, of Euro Money's uh, Cyrus Ardalan, who is um, eminent career in, in banking, but is currently he's speaking to us next week as in his capacity as chairman for the International Financing Facility for Immunization, uh, which is clearly topical. And that is going to be at 4 p.m. Um, UK time next Thursday. But obviously anybody who's been on this call will get uh, a note to that effect. Um, so Gabriel, Dante, thank you both very much for taking part. Thanks also to Claudia, our producer, uh, who hasn't needed to, to speak, but I'm sure is, is there. Say hello, Claudia, so we know. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. She, she's there. Uh, the producer, she's produced this thing, but of course there's a whole team of, of Euromoney people all working from home who put this together. Uh, so thank you to all of them. And thank you to all of you for listening sorry if we didn't get to your favorite question and uh, for being a great audience so uh, you can send any comments or or amusing TikTok clips or anything like that that you think we might we might we might enjoy to uh, streams streams at euromoney.com uh, or of course you, you can find us on social media wherever you'd expect to look so um as somebody once said uh, be careful out there everyone and Thank you very much for taking part and good day to you all. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Everyone. Goodbye. Stay healthy. Okay.